We've come to our final session on Thrive, where we've learned that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have been called to thrive, to grow and develop, to flourish. In this session, we'll focus on the last letter of the acronym, E, which stands for Embrace the Promise of Jesus Christ's Return. How does knowing that Jesus will fulfill his promise to return affect the way we live each day? How does that knowledge drive us to grow, develop, and fulfill our calling? The promise of Christ's return should always be on our mind because it changes the way that we live and approach situations of life. When Jesus told the disciples about his return in John 14, he did so to comfort and encourage them. His promise continues to do the same for his disciples today. Jesus' words in John 14, 1-3 are, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. After he ascended back to the Father, the angels spoke these words. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. It is as certain as the sun rises each morning that Jesus will return. This knowledge should comfort us during life's most difficult moments and enhance our joy during our greatest days because we know that a greater celebration awaits us when we will see our Savior face to face. How do we embrace the promise of Jesus Christ's return? First, we embrace the promise of his return by preparing ourselves for it already now, by applying the gospel to every part of our life. That means that in all the places of our life, we strive to glorify God. We will spend eternity in the presence of God, glorifying him. And the best way to prepare ourselves for that eternity is to already glorify him today in all that we say and do. We can glorify him by loving others, friends and enemies, and in doing so, share the love of the Lord. That means we have to be willing to give up our own ideas in order to show kindness and love to someone else so that they may experience the love of God. Do we glorify him in our daily work, in our marriage, in the parenting of our children, in our friendships, in our free time, in our caring for one another? This is not an easy thing to do because we are in a constant battle with our old nature. And to glorify him in all we do means that we are willing to surrender our will to his at all times. It means that we are focused on loving him above all things, that we don't allow anything or anyone else to take his place in our heart. Our God is our life. When we embrace him as the treasure of our life, we can glorify him. The gospel is salvation for those who believe. When the gospel is applied to our lives, it changes our approach to each day as we live mindful of the Lord's return. As children of God, we already perceive elements of his kingdom today because when we are near to Jesus, we are near to his kingdom. One day, the kingdom will come in its fullness. Until that time, we are to be a prefiguration of the kingdom, opening the eyes of others to the glory of God. This leads us to our second way of embracing the promise of Christ's return, which is to be eternity-minded, future-oriented, and focused on his promise. Apostle Paul focused on what was to be in the future as he went forward with his mission to share the gospel with the Gentiles. In Philippians 3, 8 to 14, he writes, Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Pausing here for a moment, I'd like to underline what Paul is saying about faith. Recognizing that his own righteousness cannot earn him salvation, he surrenders himself to the faith in Jesus Christ that he has been given so that the righteousness of Christ would become his. Only after the righteousness of Christ has been shared with us through faith can the way to his eternal kingdom be open to us. Paul then continues, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How did Paul go about focusing on the future? He pressed forward with a desire to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and to, be, to become like him, hoping to attain a, a resurrection like his. He did that by forgetting the things that weren't going to be helpful in this pursuit and sought after knowledge of God. He was constantly moving forward pressing on toward the goal, the prize of the upward call of God. Paul was aware that he was moving toward a finish line. And just like a runner in a race, he leaned forward with an earnest desire to take hold of the prize. He, like us, didn't ha happen upon this way. We are called to it. Therefore, it becomes our daily joy to fulfill the will of God and take hold of the prize to glorify God and his kingdom for all eternity. We thrive when we press forward and keep our eyes on the goal that is before us. Our future drives our life and fills us with great joy because we know that our calling is from God and it is unchangeable.